So one of the things that you're beginning to see with what the Lord is teaching us is that we need to be intimate with Him. Amen. So as you look up here, you see people playing and singing, but we're kind of like a little family group. And we struggle with stuff too, and we go through stuff, and we taxi through stuff, and we find truth, and we hold on, and we move to the end, right? Because we understand that this is for you. We don't do this for us. It can't be that way. Because if it is as selfish and self-centered, then that's not Jesus, and that's not love. We do this to bring you into his presence. So as we come to this song, I, you may have heard it on the radio. You, you may know it by heart. I just, I want you to take a, a, a time of intimacy with you and the Lord, okay? Just a time of, she's getting her intimacy outside. <laughs> I guess she's filled with the spirit. <laughs> All right. So I just want to—I I just want you to, to, to join with us and, and understand how much your father really does love you, and that when you sing this song, he's already smiling before you start. Amen. Amen.
It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Okay, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to read it. No 1 Samuel 17. See, he's not even there yet. 1 Samuel 17. All right, so this is the story of David and Goliath. A lot of our, our kiddos probably know this story. A lot of you probably know this story. But if you don't know this story, that's okay. Let me give you the, the cliff notes. The way they fought back then is not how we fight today, obviously. So what they would do is one side would take their army and they would encamp on the side of the mountain. And then on the other side, there would be a mountain, there'd be a valley in between. And the armies would face each other and they'd taunt each other and they, you know, blah, 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 and all that stuff. But when it came time to settle the score, they had a battle, okay? Now, either all of the armies went in and battled, whoever was the best came out and won, or what you're going to see today is they would send a representative, okay? So the, the Philistines, which are the bad guys, but they're not bad guys, they're just influenced by demonic oppression. Amen. Y'all need to seriously separate people from demonic oppression. Amen. Because it's way too prevalent to look at somebody and call them something when that's not who they are. Because that's not who God made them to be. Amen. So don't you... Keep telling the enemy's lies toward them. That means forgiveness too, by the way. So anyway, in this passage, they choose this dude, this dude named Goliath. He's like nine feet tall. The description is in there. He's got this heavy armor on. He's bad looking. Okay? Now, he's a giant. 
Now, this is going to connect to the old story before, right? God created the earth. Where did the enemy come from in the garden? Well, he was with God and decided, I want to be like God. And he took a whole bunch of them with him and said, let's go just destroy God's creation. Because we want to be like them. Because we want to be gods too. We want to rule and reign too. Because that's what God created you for. Do you understand that? Are you sure? Genesis chapter 1. What did he say? Let us make man in our image, right, to rule over. He wants to have a relationship of ruling with you. Amen. Not a, no, 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 a relationship. Are you following me? Because that's what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked around with them in the cool of the day. Amen. Amen. That's relationship to me. That's not service. Right. Amen. It's not service. You're not serving the Lord. You're living with him. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. You're going to see the difference in this story. Yeah. You're going to see the difference between somebody who wants to serve the Lord and somebody who says, oh, no, 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 this is the state that we have to take. Now, so this giant, he's bad, right? He has a, a, he's a Nephilim. He's got this demonic oppression. He's got this demonic thing inside of him. And all he wants to do is kill the Israelites. Why? Because they're God's chosen people. I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to say that one more time. And then I'm going to say it again differently. The demons, the, they all came against Israel because they were God's chosen people. Amen. Where do you fit in? You're God's chosen people. Amen. So is the enemy coming against you? Yeah. Oh, Lord, yes! You should see, oh, I should see. That's not the response of Christ. <laughs> Seriously. We're going to see it. Now, go to verse number 8 of 1 Samuel 17. This is now Goliath coming out to propose, you send me somebody of your little clan, and we'll fight together, and whoever wins, wins. Watch what he says, verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle formation? Am I not the Philistine? Get it? The Philistine. He thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. Pride comes before a Hmm. Isn't that biblical? Choose a man as your representative and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will become your servants. If I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I have defied the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine... They were dismayed and very fearful. Too many times when pressure comes on a believer's life, that's exactly what you get. You get depression, you get anxiety, you get dismay, and you get fear. I can't tell you how many times I hear people post it all the time. My anxiety is just overwhelmingly. Yeah, because you keep putting it on yourself. You're not created for anxiety. Was Jesus created for anxiety? Did Jesus walk around and say, my anxiety is just taking me over today? Oops. Where did you learn that terminology from? Not from him. So maybe you need to change your vocabulary. Amen. Maybe you need to change the truth about who you really are. That it really isn't about you. See, this is what it all boils down to. It's not about you. You think your life is for you. No, the Bible says that your life, you were created to love. Amen. How do I do that? How do I serve in love? Wrong question. Wrong question. Very wrong question. How do I love while I'm serving? Yes. You see, he's not a store manager. He's Jesus. He's love walking around doing that job. God can so say, guess what, Craig? We're not doing this. We're, we're going to go to Oregon and we're going to have a mass revival over there. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. See? Boom. They're already gone. Why? They've surrendered. So have you surrendered to everything that God is calling you to? Now watch this. Don't start making a list. It's one word. Love. Have you surrendered to love in your life? Have you surrendered to the fact that that's what you were created for? That's what the Bible says. Let us make man in. You were made to be love. And now you have this example 
of this enemy that comes, comes in front of them. All of Israel is terrified. Okay. I love this part. Who in here is the baby of the family? Are you the baby of the family? Oh, baby Huey. Okay. Yeah, all my older brothers love to call me their baby brother. Baby Huey brother. We've always been taught you're at the end of the line, you know. Of course, we were spoiled, right? See, that's terrible. I can't believe you would accept that. No, we were. Come on, we were the last. Mom wanted it, you know, right? So we, and all our other brothers didn't like us anymore. anymore. Right? We came in. We hit our head on the TV, and the TV got taken out of the room. It didn't happen to you. It happened to me. I was two years old, and I, well, I didn't know what I did. And I hit my head on the TV, and my mom, because the TVs back then were, like, sharp. Like, anyway. So I cut my, and I had to get stitches. She took it out of the room. My brother was so mad. <laughs> so mad. Now, you know why he just brought that story back? To show you how easy it is for the enemy to get into your past and take it down. I could so get self-centered about that one. <gasps> Man, I can't believe that I did that to my brother. Now, my brother could still be mad to this day. He may be, I don't know how I bring up. But he may be mad to this day. What life is that producing? Right. See, you really do need to cut off the past. You need to walk away from it. Because now watch what happens. Nobody moves. Except this one kid. <coughs> who's not even supposed to be there. Verse 17. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. The man whose name was Jesse. And he had how many? Eight sons. David's the last. How many are in front of David? Seven. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, which it should be their right and their ability. And the names of his three sons who had gone into the battle were Eliab, the what? Firstborn. Okay, stop there for just a second and look at it. Eliab is the firstborn. What have we learned about firstborn sons? They're supposed to be the example for the family. That's what Jesus was. He's the firstborn son among many. Wow! Who are they? I'm looking at them. Amen. Really? He is the firstborn among many. How is that not landing? Oh, it's landed. <laughs> Maybe it's just like, because everybody's like, it's, wow. yeah. He's the firstborn among many. When Jesus came, what did he say? I give you the authority to do the same thing I did. See, but we've been taught that we can't. We've gone through legalistic and religious teachings that say you can't. Because that's not how things are. That's not what Jesus is. It's all about love. It's not about performance. It's not about service. It's not about anything. So now David stands up. Now, Eliab is the firstborn son. The second him, Abinadab. The third, Shema. So David was the youngest. Now, the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. He's going back and forth. And the Philistine came forward morning and evening and took his stand for 40 days. Okay, now 40 days in Scripture should be a big number for you. When you read 40 in the Bible, it means testing. Moses had three 40-year periods in his life. He was tested three specific times in the area that he was in. 40 is always a number for testing. Jesus was in the wilderness for how long? 40 days being tested. His wilderness was a whole lot different than the Israelites' wilderness because the Israelites, all they did was mumble and grumble. Jesus came out with power and authority. Amen. Let's do that wilderness, right? Yes. So now, as we see this, then Jesse said to his son David, verse 17, take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Who gave him the instruction to do this? Do you get that? His dad said, son, go take this to the front lines. 
Who told him to do that? His father. He has instruction to be there. You need to get that because it's going to get real important here in a second. He has a reason to be there because his father sent him to that place. Yes. Get it? You get it? Go watch. Verse 18. Bring also these ten slices of cheese to the commander of their thousands and look into the well-being of your brothers and bring back confirmation from them. For Saul and they are all the men of Israel and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning like his dad told him to do. He left the flock with a keeper. Oh, see that one? That's a nugget for you. He left the flock with a keeper. Who would you leave your flock to? Just anybody. How do you know the person that you should leave your flock to? If they exhibit love. I'm not going to leave my child or my animals with somebody who's going to be brutal with them. Would you? No. But if that person displays love, kindness, forgiveness, and you know them, See, so you don't know about them, you know them. Big difference. Big difference. Come on now. Ooh. Okay, verse number 20. David got up early in the morning, left the flock with the keeper, took the supplies, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment, the entrenchment, encircling the camp while the army was going out in battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle formation. Army against army. They've been doing this for 40 days. And nothing's changing. Maybe something new needs to take place. Verse 23. As he was speaking with them, behold, the chief... Oh, verse 22, I skipped. Then David left the baggage of the care in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line. You know, it's kind of interesting. This is on the spot God's given this to me now. But twice, David left his responsibility with somebody else. But he didn't just leave it and walk away. Exactly. I think that's kind of interesting. This is, an, this is a me getting the teaching moment right now for all of us. Because I, I, that's, pretty neat. that's pretty interesting. Why? Maybe David cared for what God had brought into his life. Yes. No matter what. who or what it was. Amen. Maybe David had a higher view of what life really is about. Yes. Maybe it's not about David becoming the best. Because I read nowhere in scripture where David fought to overcome his brothers. Ever. Ever. But God saw his heart. Coming back to the heart of worship. <laughs> that sounds so sad back there. <laughs> anyway. Verse 23, as he was speaking with them, behold, the champion and the Philistine came. The Philistine from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were very fearful. And the men of Israel, the men, the men plural, the men plural, where's the ladies at? Of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will make the man who kills him wealthy with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. I have no answer, so I'm just going to throw money out there. It's exactly what Saul said. I can't, I can't beat this guy. I'm going to have to find somebody. I'm going to have to pay for it. Wrong answer. Do you understand that at the beginning of the story, God brought... Goliath to the battlefront? Yes. You see, the Philistines thought they were all that. God saying, come on. I'm going to teach you a lesson too. <laughs> yes. You don't mess with me. These Nephilim have been messing with people for decades. Come on now. Now look. Then David said to the men who were standing by him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and rids Israel of his disgrace? 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has dared to defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in agreement with this statement, saying, This is what will be done to the man who kills him. Verse 28. Remember Eliab? He's the firstborn son. He should be the one to give guidance. When his little brother comes to him, he should say, Hey, little brother, this is the situation. Watch what he says. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard him when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, Why is it that you have come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? There's your answer. There's your answer. Wow, that's cool. Who have you left it? Hey, it's in the care of somebody. But David said, What have I done now? What does this tell you? Come on, little ones. What does this tell you? What have I done now? What does that imply? That they're always saying something. That he always, they are always implying that he's doing something wrong. Anybody here think the enemy's trying to tell you you're always doing something wrong? Yeah. Eliab's the firstborn son should have his tail out there fighting Goliath with the power of God. But all he sees, now watch this, all he sees is the enemy. And the only way that he knows to attack the enemy is to side with the king, wait for somebody to step up. And then when somebody does step up, he's mad. He's mad. Why? Because it's my little brother. Now watch, what is my little brother going to do? He's going to upstage me. Why would he be thinking that? Because he's seen David's life. He knows what's about to take place. He's seen David with the, the bear, the lion. He knows all the stories. He knows David's heart. When God says David was a man after his own heart, it didn't just happen one day. No. God came to him and David responded. Steal, God. And the Holy Spirit is intimate with David in the Old Testament. Yes. <laughs> and so now here's Eliab, his own brother, telling him, what are you doing? You can't be here. Is this it? This is it. Don't you be an Eliab to somebody. At all. Don't you ever be an Eliab to somebody. Amen. Don't you ever be, what does it say? Metal in somebody else's microwave. Don't ever be that person. See, David went there because his father commanded him to. So what was David doing? Following his father's command. He gets out there. Now his older brother, who when you're away from father, older brother kind of takes charge yeah. with me. So now older brother says, what are you doing here? What are you here? David could have turned and ran tail. And he would have been justified to a degree because he listened to his big brother. But he knew that his call was out there to do what? Check on the care of your brothers. David didn't go out there to fight a Philistine. He went out to see how his family was doing. Yes. Not just his brothers, his family. Yes. Israel is his family. Yes. So when he goes out there, he sees his family in trouble. And he sees this, this Philistine standing there. And the very first thing that goes through his mind, now what's this? Ooh. We are in verse number 28 in the middle. And, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I myself know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart. That's not what God says, but the world will try to tell you that. Don't let them know listen to that. For you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people replied the same words as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they informed Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, may no one's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. But Saul said to David, nope, you're too small. 
Let me give you a whole bunch of armor. Put that on you. David can't even do that. He can't even do that. He puts, he can't move. Because man's creation to protect you is never going to be good enough. God's supernatural protection is all you need. Amen. You amen that, but do you believe that? Yes. Don't walk in sickness. Sickness ain't from God. Amen. Oh, this is just something for God to test me. God doesn't do that. God, listen. Have you ever heard of people getting healed? Yeah, yeah like infirmities, and they can walk and stuff like that, right? So that would be God healing them, right? Yeah. So if God brought the infirmity, isn't God against himself by healing it? He would be. And a house divided against itself can't stand. That came out of God's own mouth. So maybe these sicknesses and things are consequences of bad choices. And maybe God wants your faith to grow so that you can heal. Yes. And you can heal others. Amen. Because it's not about you. It's about love. Amen. Right. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with love. Who am I? Love. So that's who you were created to be. You weren't created to be Eliab. To stand in the back. To view the arena. And pick out fault. After fault. After fault. After fault. After fault. This is wrong. This isn't wrong. This isn't right. This isn't right. That is a critical self-centered attitude. That's all that is. Yeah. And all you're saying is it doesn't meet my standard, so it's not good enough. <laughs> the whole while, the spirit of David walks right past you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take care of this. Yep. The end of the story, David goes and he picks up five stones. Anybody know why? Five is the number of grace. Because Goliath had four brothers. Bring them all. <laughs> Amen. David, short dude, baby in the family, runt. They were giants. Bring them all. I'll kill them all. Because David knew the power wasn't him. That's right. It wasn't, he didn't look back into his life and say, okay, I've killed a lion, a bear, and I've killed this, that, and the other thing. I've done all these things. God himself even said that my heart is just like him. So, when I go out there, God has to do this for me. No, he's walking in a totally different identity of who he is. He's walking in the identity that this is God's fight and he's brought me here. So if he's brought me here, what do you want to do? How many of you are going to walk into a fight and say, what do you want me to do? Not many. A lot of us are just run away. But see, when you're in the moment, when it's happening, who do you think you are? Are you the Eliab being critical? This can't work. That can't work. That's not going to happen. Or are you the David? I'm going to walk in love and do what love does. Apparently love takes a rock, hits you square in the noggin, drops nine foot like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> then you take the dude's own sword, cut off his head, and Hey guys, can we go have dinner now? <laughs> Here's the, the part that gets me. God had 40 days to send David to the front line. Mm. Look at it. 40 days. It should have been taken care of the same day. It could have. If any one of the thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Israelite army that were out there, if just one yep. would have walked in their identity of who God says you are, yep. could have changed the whole thing. But 40 days. Sometimes when the trials come and we get pushed back in our mind to those places that we've been or those things that are going on or those things that are going wrong that are, they, they feel like they're holding us from behind. When we get there and it feels like the weight is there, your answer literally is intimacy with God. Yes. That's all I can tell you. You can't do anything. You can't work anything out. You can't serve. You can't say hello to enough people. The only thing that you can do is take the moment and stop. Father God. Now I want you to understand the importance of those two words. 
Father God, I learned this last week, profound. Father, born from. Father, born from. My Father, our Father, yes. who is in heaven. heaven. So what you're saying is you have been born from Him. Father God, who is God. God is the creator and sustainer of life. Yes. So now, I am a child of the one who sustains me and gives me life. Yes. To give to others. Yes. Father God. Those two words make the devil screech. Especially when you know what they mean. You have to connect them to yourself. Because I can tell you for years and decades and decades, I would say... Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven. That's called penance, and that's what you do, right, when you're, when you're in a, a, a legalistic religion that says that you can only do these things in order to get right with God. When Jesus already made you right when he died on the cross. Yeah. So what are they teaching? They're teaching control. Sorry. It's everything religion is. It's control. And guess what? You are not going to get that here. You come in here, you're going to get relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship because that is what God created you for. Relationship. Amen. He created you to be loved, to love others. So that they could come in, we could corporately worship together, and we could bless our Father in heaven, and the whole entire place is going to be changed because of one word that's love. Because yeah. Amen. Amen. you're not an alien. You're not an alien. The enemy is going to try to make you think you're an alien. Critical words may even fly out of your mouth, but that's not who you are. You have to know in that moment, when it comes out, that's not who I am. And we need people surrounding us to be bold enough to tell us that. That's not who you are. Stop talking like that. Stop putting that thing over yourself. You get in a room full of people and they start talking about, you know, it's okay to not be okay and this, that, and that. And I just, I can't connect with that. I am okay. Amen. I have no sin in my life. The Lord God Almighty loves me. Amen. Okay? Every sin that I've ever committed has been completely washed clean. Amen. And he wants to live with me. Yes. And he does this thing with me. I'm okay. I'm not not okay. I'm okay. Amen. I'm okay. Look, sometimes I may look like I'm not okay, but believe me in that moment, I'm okay. Because that's the truth of who you are. You're okay. Amen. <coughs> it's who you are. He changed it all. Amen. Love won over you. Amen. You are not, you are not no longer this messed up mistake, issue, problem thing. You are light, love. You are complete in Him. Amen. You are holy, blameless, beyond reproach. You are these things because He said so. See, that's the David mentality. David's not walking in this presumptuousness, saying that he's all that in the bag of chips, but he was all that in the bag of chips because he just walked up there and said, bam, poof, there you go, done. But look, he never made a big thing out of it. part. Your uniqueness as a child of God and a bearer of light and love. Your uniqueness in who you are. Because I can't be you. I can't be you. You can't be me. Right? We see all these people and we think, wow, I like to be like them. No, no, no. You be you. Okay? With the love that God's given you. Yes. That uniqueness of who you are, yes. we need. If you're trying to be somebody else, we're not right. Because you were made to be loved. You were made to please people. You were made to say, well, when they call, I've got to run. Some of us are in environments where it's toxic. Totally, totally toxic. And we just sit there and pray, God, change that person. God, change that person. God, change that person. He's going, I'm trying to, but you won't listen. <laughs> I 
put you there to be love. So show love. Love isn't, I'm going to put some poison in her food. <laughs> what is love? Forgiveness, kindness, kindness goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of these things are from the Spirit. That's all who you are. When, I, when he gave me this, I was so focused on Eliab. I don't want them to be like Eliab. I don't want them to be like Eliab. And all he keeps telling them, just tell them they're all like David. Because that's really who you are. Hey, yeah. But you have to believe that. You have to grip that. You have to take that for yourself. Because God didn't make you to be a mistake. He didn't make you to get into this world, stumble, and fall. Even if you have, he's going to use it for good. I promise you, I've seen it. Yes. God restores families. Yeah. Yeah. He is the restorer of physical touch. Prophesied about it like nine months ago, and then boom, it came to pass. Saw it with my own eyes. You can't tell me that God doesn't love you. You can't tell me that God doesn't care. You can't tell me that God doesn't want to use you to change the lives of people. You can't tell me that. That's who you are. That's what you were created for. Amen. On purpose. <laughs> On purpose. <laughs> yes. I just want you to know you're not alone. It's not really exactly what you're saying. <laughs> and thank Jesus for it. Amen. 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 Look, too many times in your life you've been told you've been less than. You're the baby of the family. You're this. You're just a drug addict. You're just an alcoholic. You're just this. You're just that. Those descriptions are not in God's mouth. No. Okay? When you hear those things, would God say that to me? No. No. You useless alcoholic. There you go again. I cannot believe you. I, I died for you on the cross. And this is how you repay me? Nope. Tell me God will talk to you like that. Yeah. Your earthly parents might, but not God, because that's not love. Amen. Where is that going to get you? Think about it. All I'm going to do is drink more, because obviously I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm useless. But what if? What if things changed? What if we started showing people their worth? Amen. And not pointing out their flaws. Amen. And start showing them who they are in Christ. Yes. Boy, that would be so much better. To walk into a store and see someone, to have to strike up a conversation, just leave on purpose saying what God told you to say. Isn't that much better than, I can't believe he has a tattoo on his arm. <laughs> How can she wear those shoes they don't match? What? Come on. We can think of tons of stuff. Okay, he's telling me. You're fabulous. Let's pray. Father God, the one who has borne each and every one of us, we humbly are here in your presence. And I thank you for the word of encouragement you've given us. Yes. That you have made us to be in the spirit of David. To take a stand when you call. And not to be among the myriads who stand by the way and look and criticize and only worry about themselves. You've called each and every person that's here and that is listening to my voice to be love. That's what you've created us for. The goal of our instruction, the whole goal of our life is love. To be love. Not to need it. And Lord, as I sit here, if this was my last day, oh, the blessing and the hearts in front of me. Oh my God, I thank you so much for each and every one of them. For their uniqueness, for their spunk, for their tenacity, for their endurance, Lord for the things that you do to them, their, their creativity and their, their response to your call. Lord God, I thank you so much for the blessing that you've given us to be, that we are the spirit of David. And Father, you have called us to walk in that way. Yes. Father, I thank you. And by faith and the grace in which we stand in you, 
we say it is true. Amen.